Tenakoto Tefano o Auckland Unitarian. Tenakoto Naman Hiri. No my higher my higher my ki ten a hui tenakoto tenatato katoa. I want to wish everyone a happy Mother's Day, though I usually avoid a Hallmark holiday because it annoys me uh, that uh, corporations and others have used what should be a very sacred day to uh, profit. But since becoming a Unitarian minister, I learned that it's not a Hallmark holiday, it's a Unitarian holiday. Back in 1870, after the world, uh, Civil War in America, uh, Julia Ward Howe, famous for her Battle Hymn of the Republic, uh, wrote and published a proclamation for Mother's Day. And part of that proclamation read as follows. Arise all women who have hearts, whether your baptism be that of water or of tears. Say firmly, we will not have great questions decided by irrelevant agencies. Our husbands shall not come to us reeking with carnage for caresses and applause. Our sons shall not be taken from us to unlearn all that we have been able to teach them of charity, mercy, and patience. We women of one country will be too tender of those of another country to allow our sons to be trained to injure theirs. From the bosom of the devastated earth, a voice goes up with our own. It says, disarm, disarm. The sword is not the balance of justice. Blood does not wipe out dishonor nor violence indicate possession. Julia Ward Howe started life as I did as an Episcopalian and became a Unitarian a very um, important figure in American literature. She was a poet and author. She was also uh, a strong abolitionist prior to the Civil War. And, and after the Civil War became a strong advocate for women's rights. So on this Mother's Day, let us remember the purpose uh, for why it was established in the first place. Yes, by 1907, uh, it was declared after being pushed by a woman to become a national holiday and Woodrow Wilson signed that proclamation, uh, I believe in 1911. But since then, Hallmark took it over. It's time for us to take it back. This morning, uh, our guest speaker is Derek Hanley, a member of the congregation uh, who has many gifts and has, uh, has many irons in the fire. One of which is to be working on a master's in religion from Harvard. He is, uh, I've invited him to be our muser today and to speak to some of the thoughts he's been having during this pandemic. So I welcome Derek and I welcome all of you. May just seeing each other's faces give us shelter. May this Zoom community break through our loneliness, and may you feel the embrace of a larger spirit of life and love. Come, let us worship together.
So if you have your chalice or candle or virtual or real, um, it's now time to light it. We kindle this flame with love for mothers and foremothers, past, present, and future. We kindle this flame in celebration of community and its generations. We kindle this flame with respect and support for the greater circle of life of which we are all a part. Some of you will know I've given a couple of uh, talks at the Meeting House, which is a very different, obviously a very different environment. This environment feels more like a living room. So I'm uh, more, you know, more approaching it that way. And I wanted to share with you uh, some things that I'm learning and that I'm exploring that I find really interesting and hopefully you do too. And so this, the whole thread of uh, what I'll share today is really around and drawing from uh, Emerson, so Ralph Waldo Emerson, of which Clay's dog is named after Waldo and my son is named after Emerson. And I don't know whether Ralph, if anyone's named after Ralph, but yep. yeah. so I'll, I'll first start with some words from uh, one of his most, I guess, famous and at least to me, meaningful and profound essays, uh, self-reliance, and then share some musings. So from self-reliance, but do your work and I shall know you do your work and you shall reinforce yourself. A man must consider what a blind man's bluff is this game of conformity. If I know your sect, I anticipate your argument. I hear a preacher announce for his text and topic, the expediency of one of the institutions of his church. Don't I know beforehand that he could not possibly say a new and spontaneous word? Don't I know that he has pledged to himself to only look at one side, the permitted side, not as a man, but as a parish minister? He is a retained attorney and these heirs of the bench are the emptiest affectation. Well, most men have bound their eyes with one or another handkerchief and attached themselves to some one of these communities of opinion. Emerson was a Unitarian preacher once, 1829 to 1832, uh, the second church in Boston. Um, he grew up, I think, as a fifth generation uh, preacher in uh, New England. His father died when he was eight and his father had ideas to create a church uh, that was almost like a forerunner of kind of, you know, the kind of thing that, uh, that we have in Ponsonby, which was you didn't have to, to claim a belief or a faith in anything and all were, all were welcome. Uh, Emerson as a young man was not really drawn to or into uh, Unitarianism or divinity or the church, but because his father died and his older brother beat him to the punch by becoming a minister, becoming a minister and then quitting, <laughs> his mother um, really, I think it fell to Emerson to follow suit and, and try and follow in the footsteps of these many generations that had come before him. And so really I, I, I draw that he went to divinity school more out of duty than passion. And to me, what was, is fascinating and why I'm really researching and learning about him at the moment is how he evolved from uh, that to who he is, uh, as we know him now, and the influence he had on Unitarianism. And really what you can get uh, the most, where you can get the most juice from is in his diaries, where you can hear and see his own voice speaking to himself, and you get a much truer picture of what he's thinking. So he goes to university. Uh, he joins the Second Church in Boston, uh, the Unitarians, in 1829. Um, he doesn't do very well at Harvard uh, Divinity School. Uh, some kind of accounts are that he doesn't really even go. And while he's studying, he writes his brother Edward that he might give up on the whole affair of becoming a minister. 
he also kind of attacks and uh, lambasts the, what he calls the degeneracy of the pulpit, um, kind of using tired tropes, repeating, repeating repeated uh, motifs, and really not breaking out and being creative. And three years later, he wrote to his brother, William, I meditate now and then total abdication. So he hasn't even got out of university. He hasn't started at the Unitarian Church yet, and he's already talking a lot about quitting. He gets there in 1829. Uh, he's meant to be the sidekick to another minister who's already there, but that minister's in Europe, and all the, he decides he's not going to come back. And so all of a sudden, Emerson becomes the main preacher at the Second Church in Boston, and he begins his ministry. And for all accounts, his congregation love him. They love having him. He uh, enjoys small parts of it, but for the most part, isn't really enjoying the overall uh, package of what it is to be a minister. Uh, there are comments that he's uh, uh, terrible in situations like funerals or hanging out with the congregation, but he's really strong when he's preaching and uh, sharing his views and his stories on the world. But barely three years in, uh, he meets a crossroads in 1832. Over the last year or so, he's increasingly beginning to scrutinize, among other things, the Lord's Supper, the rite of communion. And a few things come to him. Did Jesus really mean you have to do this forever? Or was he just having a good final meal with his friends? Did these instructions really happen and get handed down to generations and generations all the way to today or to his time, he's questioning because they only appear in one of the gospels. Matthew and Mark don't mention the idea that we should have communion at all. And John doesn't even mention the supper happened at all. To only Luke who wasn't even present has included the instructions to do this in remembrance of me, of which how communion has come about. The first insight from this story is that we can take away to watch ourselves question whether we are acting in the spirit of something versus the letter of it. So words matter. They do matter, but often behind words, there's a much bigger spirit and intention, which matters a lot more. And I think that's what Emerson was questioning and challenging using the communion just as an example. Today, when we think about social distancing, we know what it means. It doesn't mean distance yourself entirely from society. That's not what it means, even though the words kind of mean that. What it means in spirit is carry on socializing, but just do it from a physical distance. So even if Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me to his disciples at the Last Supper, does it necessarily mean you and all future generations of Christians must act out this right until the end of days? That's kind of what Emerson was trying to get at. And at least that's what Emerson concluded. And he drew a lot of that conclusion from the fact that Jesus consistently taught through parables. And yet parts are being taken in literal textual form. So he brings this up and the congregation disagree with him. And ultimately it creates what is known in the Unitarian history as this resignation of Emerson three years in, never to return as a minister to any church. And the issue is he can't agree with the congregation whether to carry out communion or not. And for him, it's a catalyst to leave the church. So he submits his resignation. But going down all the almost 200 years, that act in itself has almost become something that is taken literally, uh, even in... Um, the Unitarian uh, of today, Unitarian Association of America, on the website, if you go look into the classes and the lessons for adult education, they will explain that Emerson resigned also because he came to a disagreement around communion, which to me is very similar to, uh, to saying that Jesus intended you to do this right forever, taking the words and not looking at what lay behind it. Emerson was never saying you and I should never do communion. He just said he didn't want to do it. And in fact, he says in his resignation sermon, I'm content that it stand to the end of the world, if it please men and please heaven 
and I shall rejoice in all the good it produces. He's saying, I don't want to do it because I don't believe in it. And if you study as I've been doing the last couple of months into this, almost every single commentator in the last 200 years, including, as I mentioned, today's UUA of America, cite this conflict as the motivation for his departure. They cite the letter, not the spirit. And every time we repeat this story, we are really very much letting Emerson himself down every time we re repeat this trope. Because when you peel back the layers and look into his conversations with himself through his journals and his letters, the reasons really are that for someone who believes so deeply in listening to your heart as your guidance and following your unique path that only you are here to, to walk, he knew that every day he stood up at the second church was another day he was not eating his own dog food. He presented himself every Sunday, dressing up in a costume, playing a part in a play that going back to four or five years before divinity school, he didn't really ever believe in and wasn't his part to play. So not surprisingly at all, is that he knew this from before he went to university, to divinity school, but he let outside voices and circumstances veer and sway him on a path that wasn't his. To me, the Lord's Supper just became for him the most convenient way, the closest thing lying around for him to break free from something that he was doing that wasn't who he was. And the vital words in his resignation sermon to me are, it is my desire to do nothing which I cannot do with my whole heart. So the second insight I take from this is that we know who we wholeheartedly are and who we are meant to be. If only we pay attention and listen to ourselves. And from there, it's up to us to close the gap between what we know is true in our hearts and how we show up in the world. And Emerson's departure, I think, from the, from the second church is his first critical act of self-definition in his life, launching him into his true calling as a poet and a writer and an orator and a philosopher free from the encumbrances, the expectations and restrictions inherent in being tied to any particular idea that came before him, unless that idea was of his own creation. His motivations and appeal to us all is that the divine in whatever form we choose to believe it speaks to us in the present, not through cold forms or rituals or institutions. And when it speaks to us, we must drown out the myriad of external voices to listen. Questioning outside assumptions and practices, his quitting the pulpit is an exemplar act, I think, of self-reliance. Self-reliance on the signals that come from your own soul that in turn will lead each of us to our true vocations and our true ultimate expressions of our own lives. If only we would listen to them. And at times they're full of noise and they're shouting and yelling at us and they're obvious and they're in your face and at other times they're barely perceptible whispers. So far from being the result of a disagreement over a single solitary church ordinance or rite, his departure I think from the Boston Second Church is motivated by and representative of the purity of courage to be and live the embodiment of who we truly are, not a second-hand representation. And his move in his life are clarion calls for each of us to do the same in ours. For the breakout, I thought what we could think about is as we, at least in New Zealand, are on the verge of slowly beginning to emerge from this pandemic lockdown, we have chances to think and behave anew when we get back out into the world. We can choose to return on autopilot, or we can choose to take the days or maybe week and a half that's in front of us to think about choosing not to do things that we would typically do, being conscious about reflecting on things and saying, is that really me? Is that really the kind of thing I wanna do, even though I've been doing it the last five or 10 years? We could choose to be or not be in ways we would not or have not typically been in the, the pre-lockdown world. And my anxiety and my kind of uh, excitement is 
we have this window when the window starts to open up for us to get out back into the world. We can either choose to just rush right through it and just get back to how everything always was, or before we go through it, we can pause, have a look around, have a look at ourselves, have conversations with ourselves and think, is there any one, two, three things I might decide to be or do differently consciously as we start to reemerge. So I guess we, we could spend this 10 or 15 minutes thinking about what callings or signals you've been hearing in amongst the relative stillness of the recent weeks that you would like to make more of an effort to honor uh, as we move into the next phase instead of perhaps brush aside. It's time to extinguish the chalice. You know the words, you can say them with me. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Well, Derek, then, Back to you for our closing words. Okay, I've chosen, I, I was going to close with some Emerson words from, from Self-Reliance, but I've chosen something else from a writer, po uh, poet, John Daniel, that seems more appropriate as we get into this next week. Among other wonders of our lives, we are alive with one another. We walk here in the light of this unlikely world that isn't ours for long. May we spend generously the time we are given. May we enact our responsibilities as thoroughly as we enjoy our pleasures. May we see with clarity. May we seek a vision that serves all beings. May we honor the mystery surpassing our sight and may we hold in our hands the gift of good work and bear it forth whole as we were born forth by a power we praise to this one earth, this homeland of all we love. Thank you, everybody.